fuck, you're on candid camera, Andy. <laughs> I am. You are. You're all live and alone. Oh, boy. Welcome, everyone. Another show. It's just the Andy show now, I hope. Oh, yeah. No, hey. Hey, come on now. <laughs> this, is that, this is that uh young lion trying to boss around the old lion again. So, coming live at you, folks. Lots of stuff to talk about. Um, we'll talk about whatever you guys want to talk about as well. I had a good question come in. Um, we're going to uh, do a few things while we're waiting for an audience to come on board. Uh, show you some exercise demos, uh, things like that. One of the questions we got coming in, and of course, folks, if you're liking what we're talking about or um, you have a question and we're addressing it, uh, by all means, throw, thumb, throw some thumbs up on the screen and some hearts on the screen. Apparently, Facebook responds to those things more than likes, so uh, I just found out about that, so it's important for us if we're going to do these live sessions, so uh, the more thumbs up you throw across the screen or hearts across the screen, apparently uh, the more reach Facebook will have or something. I don't understand about Facebook al algorithms, but they do try to shut you down, so uh, the more um, emoticons you show across the screen, the better. So while we're waiting for people to come across i got a good question that someone asked me, a really good question actually, and the question was, do you have to be as low in body fat as Andy to benefit from refeeds? It's an excellent question about the cycle diet, and again, if you're interested in the cycle diet, go to the cycle.diet, that's the cycle.diet, the cycle, all one word, dot diet, no dot coms or anything else, just the cycle.diet, you can take the cycle diet course and or get the, get the book there at the cycle.diet. So, do you have to be as low in body fat as Andy to benefit from refeeds? What a great, great question. The answer is, no, you don't have to be as low um, as Andy is, but there's a difference between getting away with a refeed and having what we call a neutral effect um, versus benefiting from a refeed and having a positive effect. So, there's a neutral metabolic effect if you're not deep into supercomp, um, and then there's a beneficial uh, net effect, metabolic effect, if you are deep into super comp. So that's a very, very important question. So as long as you're in super comp, um, it won't negatively impact you cosmetically. You're not going to gain weight, get fat. So the super compensation mode principle still applies. You don't have to be as lean as Andy to benefit. I still do the cycle diet. I haven't been as lean as Andy, obviously, in in a long, long time, um, but I'm still in super comp mode, so it still behooves me to have a refeed. So that was a very, very good and very, very smart and very, very articulate question. And the answer is, the leaner a person is, and it's not natural to you, uh, then the more benefit you get from refeeds, the more metabolic optimization, the more robust your metabolism is going to be. I didn't print out what you sent me for your Sunday refeed oh, okay. uh, because we've been talking about the cycle diet and Andy's ability to refeed a lot, so I thought we'd give it a break for a week. But <coughs> I might print that out next week and give you an idea of just what a real refeed looks like because I can't eat like that anymore, but the boy can eat. Uh, but he's got all the right BMR indicators for being hypermetabolic. Body surface area, which is height, gender, Males tend to be more, have a more advantage than females, um, being lean, of course, and then age as a factor as well, being a young lion rather than an old lion. Um, that all works to Andy's benefit, and being the leaner he is, the more he can eat on a refeed day, the more benefit he experiences, okay? Are we getting some people coming on board? You know, Scott, something along the same lines. Uh, uh, Paul wants to know about your take on using vegetable protein with high carbs instead of animal protein when you refeed? Sure. I mean, I think the benefit of a refeed, of course, is to have it be enjoyable. Yeah, so absolutely. I think if you start inserting all these rules to a refeed, you kind of defeat the psychological purpose of a refeed, yeah. that if you want donuts, have friggin' donuts. Yeah. Um, so we don't focus so much on, oh, you know, I mean, I've heard... My cycle diet's been bastardized. You know how much oh, it's been bastardized online. Too, yeah. There's people who say you gotta fast the day before <laughs> and drink nothing but juice the day after. I mean, we've we've heard all kinds of stuff that's not my cycle diet. No. So, if that's your thing and you're a vegetarian, then by all means. But you can be a vegetarian and have potato chips. Um, 
if you need a refeed, you need a refeed. You can be a vegetarian and have chocolate cake yeah. or chocolate ice cream. So it's yeah. really up, up to you. There's no, there's, yeah. let's not get orthorexic about mm -hmm. it and define the refeed day in limited terms of, of, you know, only being quality mm -hmm. diet foods. A refeed, sometimes you need the empty calories just to get in the amount of calories you need. For Andy taking in 10, 12,000 calories, he's not going to get that just by eating, um, <laughs> um, nutrient-dense food, so uh, any thoughts you have on that? Yeah, I've, I've, I've had questions too where, where people are asking me, you know, if, if you know how, how many more calories they should eat on, on a refeed, and that's, that's something I've never ever calculated. Because Why would you? When you're yeah. actually in super compensation mode, I mean, any, there, there are no rules, anything goes, um, that's why... And you I go mean, according to cheesecake and yeah, you go according to biofeedback at <coughs> hunger and what you're able to eat. The whole idea of super comp is that you can eat more than you normally would, and no, more than a normal person could. <coughs> so you can sit down and eat a whole pizza, and yeah. sit down and have a yeah. whole cheesecake after because you're that deep into super comp. Yeah, there, there's so, no force feeding. Like it, it, it's not a competition to me. I I eat that much because and I it's eat not that binge much. eating because yeah. binge eating no. is an impulse control issue. No. So we keep readdressing the same things, but at the same time. Let's not overanalyze it. It's supposed to be a day away from your diet regimen. Yeah. And if you're that committed to eating clean, more power to you, but you're going to find it hard to benefit from a refeed uh, if you are that way. Because even I found, even at my age, uh, there are weeks where I've had to go deliberately more into the junk food in order to optimize my, my <coughs> metabolic effects. So, good question. Good question, though. Hey, Andy, when you uh, cut out it, uh, refeed before a photo shoot. Do you adjust your training, or do you just power through the week? No, I've, I've never adjusted my uh, adjusted my training. Um, actually, this this uh, last program that I'm on right now is is pretty much all all strength training. Yeah, we were just talking about that. There's yeah. no conditioning work. There's no cardio. There's it's it's a lot of uh, low rep ranges, five, six to eight, lots of rest in between sets. Um, yeah, so I mean, diet. Uh, determines body fat, so, um, you know, the old saying, abs are made in the kitchen, uh, that's yeah. true. So. Yeah. And, and it's true, and, and a lot of people don't realize you're never going to out-train a core or inconsistent yeah. diet. Uh, when your goal is physique transformation, remember that you're never going to outperform, out-train a poor or inconsistent diet, so that's very, very important. And the other thing is not to overanalyze it, right? So, like, we, no. were, we were just discussing this the other day, that Andy's on sort of sort of a strength protocol yeah, like, so it's got no conditioning work in it yet i get a lot of clients especially females they'll so put them on a similar thing of you and they'll write me in panic mode well there's not as much conditioning work yeah. in this program there's not a, there's not as many complexes i don't feel like i'm working hard enough mm -hmm. because they equate everything with burnout and calorie consumption and it's it's not the right kind of thinking mm -hmm. You need the proper programming at the proper time. So here's Andy on a strength protocol that has no complex. It was not really any complexes. No. Um, lots of rest yeah. in between sets. He looks the same as he always looks. So, he, But the thing is, he's got a calm, patient mind about it. He's not panicked about, oh, I'm not fat burning. Oh, I'm not fat burning. That's all done in the kitchen, and he still gets his refeed. So that was a good question as well. Man, we're getting some really good yeah, questions. Yeah, that was a good one. And along those lines, folks, for the next week or so, we're relaunching my my uh, program design masterclass, and you can find that www.http colon double slash programdesignmasterclass.com. That's programdesignmasterclass.com. Limited enrollment. If you want to learn the science and the art of program design, why someone like Andy can do a non-conditioning program, maintain a shape, why that would be right for him at a specific time. That's just one example. Yeah. Oh, so if you're a personal trainer, a coach, uh, you want to understand more of the science and the art of program design. But not only that, if you're just interested. A lot of my clients signed up the first time we launched. They love it. Um, because not only in that are you going to get programs, we, we, we break them down, we deconstruct them, we reconstruct them, we write uh, new programs based on old programs. So it shows you the variations in protocol, three-day programs, four-day programs, five-day programs, six-day programs. And we show you the hows and whys that make them programs rather than just collections of workouts yeah. that people tend to do. So if you really want to understand the science, and even if you don't, you're just an enthusiastic trainee, there's going to be programs in there that you're going to love to see and, and hear about the hows and whys of how they work. So 
Also, if you have any questions as we're doing this <coughs> live cast on program design as we're talking about this, since it's talking about the launch, then by all means, fire one ready. And don't forget, folks, as we're doing this, the more thumbs across uh, the screen and hearts, if you like what we're talking about, we don't need any phony, uh, phony applause, but uh, it does help with uh, Facebook reach. So uh, you can send those across. Just maybe take a look at Andy and there they give go. a thumbs up. There they go. Scott. Okay, good, good. Okay, question. Um, on refeeds, uh, one meal or a whole day, what is more beneficial? It depends where the person's at in Supercomp, right? I mean, yeah. I often sign people just a meal to see where they're at, especially if they're formally overweight, then you've got to be really cautious about it because they're prone to putting on fat and they might be uh, leptin resistant. I hate using words like resistant because carb yeah. resistant, insulin yeah. resistance, all the catchphrase online, which is more bullshit than anything. Well, um, We'll phase that out. Otherwise, Facebook might not shut us down. Facebook might shut I us down. Um, <coughs> so really, you know, people are looking for these one-size-fits-all. What's better, a meal or a day? Well, it yeah. depends where you're on. I mean, Andy is going to benefit for now for the next 10 years with a cheat day. He's mm -hmm. not going to get by with a cheat meal, or at least not for long. I, I couldn't get through a week probably with just one meal. I, I'd probably gas out and then Tuesday or Wednesday. I'd, I'd, you know, it wouldn't be enough calories to get me through the whole week. So. You'd do it for a photo shoot, but even then maybe not. Like yeah. it, it just depends. And this is where it helps to have a coach who can gauge these things for you and not arbitrarily say, oh, you've been dieting four weeks, have a cheat day. And meanwhile, you still got 40 pounds to lose. Mm -hmm. That's all in the book. It's all in the course. The cycle dot diet. That's the cycle dot diet. You can learn all about what super comp mode is, why there are certain competitors, competitive eaters, who compete year-round in eating contests who are thin and not fat. And how is that if they're going to uh, intake all those hot dogs or all those calories or whatever contest they're in? Um, how do they not get fat if it's all about calories in and calories out? Well, it's not about calories in and calories out. It's about training your metabolism to do what you want it to do. So that's a very important thing. For instance, one of the comments I got... The people didn't want to write on Facebook, but after our last live session, people still can't get it through their heads that you look like this all the time and there must be some ulterior, ulterior kind of point to it. So someone writes in, and I've heard this a lot about when I, when I talk about this stuff, they said, well, he can eat that way because he looks like that. No, folks, he looks like this because he eats that way. Yeah. So let's get that through your head. Enough of this, oh, it's all genetics. Enough of this... Oh, well, at the first time we've had Andy on here without a shirt, it was like, how many weeks did he diet before you had him on the live and took his shirt off? And how did he, what did he do with his water? And what did he do with his salt? And we were like, no, he looks like this all the time. No one believed it. Well, some people did who know me. But then, now that it's been every week, people are like, oh, he really does look like that all the time. So then someone writes in and says, well, he can eat that way because he looks like that. No, he looks like that because he eats this way. And that's the cycle diet lifestyle. The diet has to have two purposes. It has to serve the body and it has to be sustainable. And the way we approach sustainability is that we live in a world of food abundance. So to try to deny that and say I'm never going to eat cake again is just nonsense. Your mind won't believe it. So why lie to yourself? Why lie to your mind? Not only do we not say we'll never eat cake again, we look forward to eating oh, cake again. It's so, my favorite day of the week. Yeah. Carrot cake you made for me, for instance. So, stop with the excuses that there's something about Andy. He can eat. He can eat like that because he looks that way. No, he looks this way because he eats like that. Very, very important lesson to learn. So that's about the cycle diet. And again, remember um, uh, www dot uh, or http colon double slash programdesignmasterclass.com programdesignmasterclass.com there's only a couple weeks of enrollment we uh, limit the enrollment to a certain size class um, but you'll see a career's worth of program design one of my labor of loves is the art of program design how you can put your personal stamp on program design and how it's based in principled foundations and exercise physiology so something you want to consider any other questions coming in, cameraman? We're good. Everybody out there happy with the, with the information you're getting so far? <coughs> Just throw some thumbs across the screen and some hearts. And we're going to show you a couple uh, exercises we were working on for the hard gainer solution. Uh, how are we doing, cameraman?
Yeah, we're doing very well. Okay. Uh, lots of folks out there. Okay, so hardgainersolution.com also. The book is now turned into a website. That's hardgainersolution.com where you can get the book, get the workout, sign up, get things like that. Very, very important. So uh, today for Hard Gainer Solution course that we're going to, we're trying to shoot all the exercises and all those 80 workouts. So we had a few we thought we'd show a couple variations of. One is a couple of my new favorites uh, for back, which is the alternating pull downs, uh, which is with a neutral grip, and then the reverse grip one arm uh, pull downs, just to show you some variations. So again, <coughs> a functional trainer we just love. And yes, folks, our cameraman's under the weather today, so if you hear him hacking in the background, send him a shout out that he's feeling better, so it's, uh, we wouldn't be live if he wasn't here. He was always under the weather if he wasn't here uh, helping us out, so uh, we appreciate it. So, uh, let's get a little bit of weight on there, grab your straps. And so one of my favorites for... Um, especially when I got older, my, one of my favorites for back is the alternating pull down with a neutral grip. Andy's going to show you what that looks like. Um, and of course, you'll see it working and then we'll explain the subtleties to you about rep, rep performance and things like that. So, he gets down, neutral grip, palms face each other, he comes into the machine so he's not leaning back and then one and then the other. And of course, you should be able to see his back working. Uh, maybe you can come in closer, cameraman. I don't know. Uh, just keep it going, Andy. For yep. A good. Few reps. So we're just going to come in close so you can see. Alternating has a great bilateral effect that you don't get with normal, regular pull down variations. Excellent. Wraps it up. You should always wrap up your pull downs with power straps. Excellent work. Good. Okay, give it a rest. So that's the alternating pull down variation. Notice the rep cadence. Notice there's no nonsense like tempos and silly things like that, which are completely silly ideas. But notice he's in control of weight. All right, he gets under the weight, he pulls it down. Very, very effective. And you can see his back looks like an anatomy chart. So you should have been able to see all the muscles working. Tell them why you like that exercise. I, I, I love the pumping cadence, just the, the constant tension you get from, from the cables too. Um, it's really easy on, on, on your lower back as well, uh, the, the shoulder, shoulder girdle area. Now a lot of people, you don't see them doing them in the gym because they just the straight bar and it's either wide grip yeah. or reverse grip and yeah. pull down behind, pull down to the front. So the alternating pull down has a nice bilateral disparity effect that you can't get. But you get doing uh, lateral, or um, you get doing alternate, which is very, very important as well. So uh, we were just shooting that for the hard gainer. And then another variation that we like to do, and again, with a functional trainer, we could have come in, we could have went wider, all those kind of things. So another variation <coughs> is the single arm reverse grip pull down. And in that, there's two variations. You can get right under the machine and just do a reverse grip pull down like you would in a normal pull down machine. Or you can do an able variation, which is a step back. Andy's going to show you what that looks like with both hands. So, again, wrap it up. You should be using power straps for back work so you don't have to worry about grip. He's going to step away from the machine so that he has to lean in to force that contraction. And your support leg is always the same arm that you're working. So, right pull, right knee on the floor. He leans into it at the top. You can see everything working. And just switch sides for everybody. So now he's going to go left. Left arm, left leg. You can see that even the biceps reach and pull. The right, you see everything working through the back all the way down to the insertion points. Nice having an anatomy chart model to demo some of these exercises. And it even works the anterior chain because of the motion and the displacement of the thigh and the foot. You're going to get a lot of lower ab stabilization effects as well that you probably wouldn't consider. That's good. So that's just two subtle variations, alternating pull downs and then the single arm reverse grip pull down variation uh, from the knee mimics... Uh, hammer machine, yeah, the, right? Yeah, the hammer strength machine. Yeah, if you, so. if you don't have a hammer strength machine at your gym, this is another 
really good option. It doesn't even have to be a, a, a free motion machine either. It could be just a, a regular cable. Cable. Yeah. 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 cable machine. So that gives you another variation for back work. And again, form follows function. So one of the functions of the back muscles and the lat muscles is to pull, the, pull things down and in. So that mimics that form follows function uh, dictation quite perfectly, actually. And then the other variation is to get right underneath. So just show them what that looks like. And it's a subtle variation, but it's a variation. And remember, we talk in innervation training about ranges and planes of motion. So in this plane of motion, he's more perpendicular. He's not reaching forward. He's more under the weight. And it's a reverse grip. And you can use a neutral grip if you want. Just show them a neutral grip variation. So neutral grip just means the palms are facing. Good. Excellent. We don't have to do both sides there, but you get the idea. So there's two variations of the single arm pull down variation. Um, with a reverse grip, you can be right under it like you would for a normal reverse grip. You can be stepped away so you have to lean into it. And then, of course, you have the option of a neutral grip as well. So there's several variations of one movement, yeah. which will each and every one of those will produce a different uh, fiber recruitment excitation ability. Um, that's a big mouthful, of course, but that's the reason we practice what we call tweakology in the Able Bodies uh, camp. All right, tweaking things a little bit here and there can make a big, big difference. So sometimes the same move is actually a different move. Um, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. Questions? Uh, Scott, uh, Will wants to know, or he does know, that you're not big on macros, but his question is more about protein. What is your guideline for amount? Past protein, I eat carbs and fats and don't count, but I've never heard you speak much about protein. Yeah, it's become less and less a consideration as we go on. I think, um, I think sometimes people get carried away with categorizing me in certain certain departments that I don't, I don't yeah, sort of paint everyone with the same brush. No. If, there's, if there's a reason why, why someone would benefit from knowing macros or calories, I don't particularly rule it out just for where we're at yeah. and with most of the people I train are at. If there's a reason to give people a number, uh, I'll give them a number, but that's really a guideline more than a dictation. The problem in this industry is people treat these numbers like they're biblical, oh, biblical yeah. dictations that come from on high. I need 180 grams of protein. Yes, Lord. Uh, <laughs> like ridiculous stuff like that. Yeah. These are just guidelines to work within and around. So um, particularly, we would say around one gram per pound of body weight. Yeah. You can't go wrong. But then you need the supporting elements, right? It's a, uh, protein is like the star in a movie, and then fats and carbohydrates are the supporting actors yeah. and actresses yeah. in the movie, right? You've got to have them in order to make it all work. Yeah. Um, so that's an important yeah. Otherwise, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, protein uh, becomes a non-special energy source, and it can't uh, do what it's supposed to do, which is to build and rebuild tissue. Mm -hmm. So that's an important thing as well. So good question. Good question. Don't mind answering those. There's been a lot of good questions lately, so that's great. Any other question coming in? All right, so one thing we were discussing off camera a while ago, we thought, oh, and we forgot to talk about it, was what we call the curse of strength, all right, or oh, the yeah. strength curse. Yeah. So oftentimes when it comes to building a physique, this industry, especially online, is being um, improperly or incorrectly influenced by strength coaches, all right, who don't know a whole lot about developing physiques, and they're misinformed by their own what I call paradigm blindness, all right, or paradigm bias. So oftentimes, Andy and I were blessed because neither of us were very strong, all right, in our starting years. And we were both able to develop world-class physiques because we weren't strong. What does that mean? That doesn't make any sense. It means we weren't strong, so we weren't worshipping strength. We found other ways to work out using resistance. Yeah. With Andy's long limbs, if he was to try to worship the bench press and the squat, he probably would have blown out a knee, his back, or, uh, or his shoulder or bicep by now. That's just the way it is. I wasn't very strong either. But we both know cases um, and examples of what I call the strength curse. For instance, now at my age, I get other people writing me who are my age. They've read my book, Physique After 50. That's Physique After 50. They've read that book and then they write me and go, Scott, you described me to a T. I spent most of my younger years lifting heavy 
and now I can barely lift at all. My shoulders don't work. My knees are bad. My hips are bad. Um, all those kind of things. I've blown out my elbow. I have a former client who's had nine surgeries. He's only 60. He's had nine surgeries because of previous lifting experience, not health things. There are nine surgeries because of lifting. Torn triceps, torn biceps, um, torn rotator. Uh, what else? He blow out a knee. He's recently got a hip replacement and a knee replacement. So we call that the strength curse, where you start worshiping the numbers. In my younger days, I saw an even uh, worse uh, case I was telling you about um, than I've talked about before. I had a client, very, very strong guy. He wasn't barely 200 pounds in the off season, competed in bodybuilding 176 pounds, but he could bench press like nobody's <coughs> business because he was short and stocky. He could bench press four plates a side, that's 405 pounds, folks, and he could rep that out like, like me repping out with an empty bar. And because he was so strong, he kept worshipping the strength. And what happened, he got up to 500, 550 pounds or whatever, um, calls me one day, and because he happened to be local, I need to come by. So he came by, and he said something happened. I, I heard something that didn't sound right, and I don't feel too good. And I said, well, what were you doing? Well, I was benching 500 pounds, and he takes his shirt off, and there's a little red mark about the size of my baby fingernail. Uh, on his shoulder, and I said, oh, you've torn something in your shoulder. He said, but it doesn't, it feels worse than that. Something's going on, and you could tell he was getting white and things like that. Long story short, put him in my car, drive him to the hospital. By the time we got him to the hospital, he was black and blue from the insertion here all the way through his chest, completely tore his pec from the bone and tore his bicep. So he couldn't even reach up to scratch his head. <coughs> his bicep had rolled up by the time we got to the hospital into a little ball, in his arm, and he went into shock. First he started puking all over the place, uh, because no one would see him at first, because he was just looked like a bodybuilder in a tank top, even though he was black and blue everywhere. And then he started throwing up everywhere, and then he passed out. <coughs> and then the sad part of that story was, he was a real Iron Game enthusiast. He just loved working out. But he was so disfigured after the surgery to repair everything, big, big, gap in his chest because they had to cut out so much muscle. Tendons were all screwed up in his bicep. He never went to the beach again, never took off his shirt again. It played such a, a number on his head um, and it was such a sad thing to see. And I used to tell him, stop worshipping the weights, follow the program. Don't. I know you're a strong bencher, stop being a yeah. slave to it. Yeah. <coughs> and of course, because he had what we call the strength curse, you know, when you have that strength curse, your ego can't resist itself, right? It's just going to keep pushing the weight, pushing the weight. Because what did he hear? Everywhere everywhere you would go, you even hear, how much do you bench? Yeah. You know? And I used to surprise people when I say, I don't. And they used to like, what do you mean you don't? Well, I don't bench. It doesn't do anything for my physique, <coughs> so I don't do it. Or I would say, I don't know. And those ideas, those notions, and those statements would confuse people. So uh, you have another, you have a story of someone you know. Yeah, actually, a uh, uh, really good friend of mine, actually, he, he is uh, a strength athlete. He, he wasn't a bodybuilder, but um, just uh, freakishly strong. Probably uh, one of the strongest guys I've, I've ever seen, um, you know, in the squat, deadlift, bench press. He was a power lifter, but uh, he ended up having a, a spinal fusion surgery at 28, so... Um, How limited is he now? Uh, he's, he's pretty, he's, he's getting better, but he's, he's pretty limited in his training. Like he'll, he'll never lift the amount of weight that, that he used to. But, uh, um, I mean, even though he could lift it, his, his, you know, his skeleton couldn't take it over yeah. time, right? So, I mean, so there's a fundamental difference. And I think the reason I love the physique sculpting is because the strength element only enters in a relative way. So if people come from the strength world, they're influenced with the notion that the weights work the muscles. But the innervation training methodology that I developed in the school that Andy and I come from and believe in, we say, no, the muscles work the weights. Yeah. So it's all about that differentiation and knowing how that pans out in terms of things like program design um, and things like that, how, uh, what we call sequential <coughs> activation, which means it's all about exercise selection, that there's not a randomness to it. It's not just chest day, so I go and choose five exercises. Um, there's nothing random about innervation training methodology. Things fit like pieces of a puzzle. 
So those are the kind of things that are also in my program design masterclass, and that's uh, programdesignmasterclass.com. Enrollment's only open for a couple weeks uh, by the time you see this, um, so that's something to consider as well. So um, I noticed even the other day, um, even in here, I think uh, uh, someone was asking you, "Well, how much do you lift?" And oh, was, yeah. You know, and you had yeah. to ex go through the whole thing. Yeah. Like I, I lift what <coughs> I lift what it takes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I I was lucky. Uh, I realized early on that I was never going to be the strongest guy in the gym, but uh, I realized that um, you know I, I I could train hard. Like that didn't equate that I wasn't training hard just because I didn't lift the most. And I think that's a big problem. A lot of people assume that if they're not lifting the most weight, then they're not training hard. But then those two things aren't yeah. the same. So and that heavy is how much is on the bar. Is yeah, it's how much training. stress the muscle is under. So if if you're doing you know, a quarter range of motion and using leverage and momentum, there's not very much stress on the actual muscle. There's a lot of stress on the joint probably. But and Andy's one of many people who have come to me and thought that the, the only track there is, is is to pursue in this industry when you come and you want physique transformation, that the only that there's only a one-way track and that's competition. Yeah. Right? Oh, i got to get on a bodybuilding stage. Andy's never been on a bodybuilding yeah. stage. Never been in a strength game, yet he's been on more covers of more fitness magazines than probably any bodybuilder that I know. Um, so, you know, you find different outlets. Same thing with Trish Stratus when I trained her. She came to me, same idea. Oh, I think I want to compete. And I was like, well, why would you want to compete when you can go right to the front of the line of what competition yeah. brings people? Which was, she was like, well, what does that mean? I said, well, you can get on magazine covers right now. And she did that, became a, became a fitness uh, model superstar, then went on and became a WWE superstar, uh, that kind of thing, because I knew she had the power to control a room, uh, which is a lot different than, than just having a physique on stage that people can look at for 10 minutes. So um, there's all kinds of options, and it's, you don't have to go down the same street as everyone else. No. Think outside the box. Be creative. So... Uh, with Andy, what we saw was the potential for a great physique. Didn't know how great at first because I bulked you up for a year, right? <laughs> yeah, so, it was pretty big. <laughs> yeah, he was a pumpkin head. Um, so, yeah, imagine him with a pumpkin head. I know it's hard to believe now, but we bulked him up. But the thing is, he did it. So he did. A yeah. lot of people yeah. don't. I said, well, you got to bulk up for a year. They get six months into it. Their egos can't take it. Yeah. They go back on a diet. And then, of course, when they're hungry on a diet, they want to bulk up again. and yeah, they're, they're, they're never living in the moment. Yeah, they always want... You know, yeah. what they don't have, basically. Yeah. So, so, you know, the goal is the process. The process is the goal. So, <coughs> so very, very important stuff to consider. Um, so we showed you a couple exercises. And we talked about the strength curse or the curse of strength. And a lot of people will attack us on that one, especially the macho uh, strong yeah. guys out there will want to have something to say about that. And that's fine. I, I, yeah, I get it. It's, strength is impressive. I mean, yeah. We're not saying it's not. No, no, no. no. We're it's, just saying a lot of people are cursed with yeah. that gift yeah. of strength, and it can become a curse if you become a slave to it. So that's something important to consider. Especially if you don't have it and you're trying to acquire strength, try to, you know, trying to lift on a competitive more weight, level, yeah. Yeah. trying then, to lift more yeah. weight than, than you're ever going to be able to lift, and that's, and there's two results that come from that, frustration and injury, yeah. so, um, yeah, so we want to point people in the other direction, and um, there's always room for, uh, for, and that same guy that tore his pec that I talked about, one of his famous expressions that he taught me a long time ago was, there's no squat rack on the beach, <coughs> so, you know, he used to say, there's no squat rack on the beach, which meant, like, you know, if you, there's lots of, I was talking about this the other day, right, and the, there's a lot of guys, um, you know, you go to the popular beaches, whatever, you'll see lots of big guys, but you, you know, none of them will turn heads like Andy will, I can guarantee you that, um, so you'll see lots of big developed guys or whatever, maybe juiced up, maybe not juiced up, but they won't have the aesthetic that Andy has established where if Andy's walking on a beach, trust me, everybody is going to notice him, whereas other people will like, like the overdeveloped physique, not like the overdeveloped physique, but there's a certain aesthetic to physique sculpting that everyone recognizes when they see it. And I think that's an important element for me. That's why I like working in the industry and doing stuff like that. So, questions, cameraman? Uh, you may be able to handle this no one. Uh, Jackie uh, tore her uh, pec muscle recently. Gosh. What type of exercise should they do until it's healed? Is there anything that you can... Well, that just, that yeah. depends on the extent of the yeah. damage, right? So that requires a <coughs> assessment. You should have, obviously, some rehab people um, helping you through that. It depends 
what they had to do to the tendon. Did they had to retie it? Did they cut it out? Did they use part of the ligament? And and uh, did they reattach the muscle to the bone? I mean, there's all kinds of variations of the surgeries that happen. Right. So um, depends on the extent of the damage. There is ways around it, but of course you have to accept that from now on there's going to be limitations in what you can and cannot do, and you work within the possibilities of those limitations. I talk about that uh, even in physique after 50. For me, you know, decades of training and outperforming what my body was capable of, osteoarthritis in, best sho in both shoulders, so I now have certain limitations, but I train all the possibilities within those limitations. So it's never an excuse not to get it done. Um, it just means that I have an opportunity to find other ways of getting it done. So without doing an assessment though, Jackie, I pause to, to comment, um, you know, and it depends where you're at in your rehab, you know, how, how recent your surgery was, how much uh, post-op you're in, how much scar tissue there is, things like that. So there's a lot of variables involved. No comments? All right. Any other things before we sign off? Uh, remember the cycle <coughs> uh, What else did we mention? HardGainerSolution.com, Program Design Masterclass.com. Limited enrollment, only open for a couple weeks. If you want to get in there and uh, addressing those questions that came in, they were great questions. Things like the strength curse and no, he can't eat like that because he looks this way. He looks this way because he eats like that. I think that's a very important lesson as well. Um, so what do you want? Any exercises you want to see, folks, before we sign off? Another edition of the Coach and Andy Show. Anything coming in? Not yet. Nothing? Okay. All right, folks. So that might wrap it up for this week. Um, again, if you liked what you're seeing, some thumbs across the screen or some hearts really <coughs> help us with Facebook reach. Uh, apparently, that's what Facebook likes more than likes. Not not that you shouldn't hit like or uh, share, that helps us too. Um, so hopefully, you know, you had some teachable learning moments in this. You saw a couple of exercise demos that hopefully you can put to good use. Um, Andy, give them something to think about. Yeah, maybe leave some uh, some comments on what, uh, what uh, some fu uh, uh, future episodes. Yeah, future topics that we could cover during the, the Coach and Andy show, because that's always good. A little bit of feedback on what maybe you're you know, what you're wondering. Yeah, because the, the question I first started out with came in after the fact and came into my email rather than, because people are, some people are just a little hesitant to comment on Facebook or whatever, yeah. but they saw the episode and they asked that great question <coughs> about do I have to be as lean as Andy to benefit from refeeds? What a great question that was uh, to lead into this uh, Facebook Live session. So that's good. And something came in, cameraman? Yeah, if, if you can, uh, uh, somebody wants to know, or Will wants to know about a, a hamstring, uh, well, let me find it here, sorry. That's okay. Hamstring barbell exercise, and Sabrina uh, is talking about some rear delt exercising. Things they want to see? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we can't do a whole lot of barbell stuff um, for hamstrings, but I will show you too. Um, so the good morning, <coughs> actually this is the heavier one. Now, obviously, in your gym, you're going to want to use a, a barbell, right? So, Andy, just show them the, the typical good morning. So, bar goes across the upper traps. Oh, yeah, you might as well face the camera. Give them a sh uh, No, sorry, back to the camera. Thanks, Angie. Yeah. <laughs> and then what he's going to do is he's going to, as he comes down, he's going to stick the butt out, right? And then he's going to come down just so he's not parallel because you don't want too much spinal compression and come up and you use as much and you can see the hamstring sweep happening as he does it a little faster Andy so they can get a all right so you can see how that affects the hamstring and then of course that's a great movement if it's done right you don't want to hyperextend and then of course as we say the ABCs of, of understanding biomechanics of an exercise the ABCs are the ground gravity and the body so if we reverse the gravitational pull on that then the obvious movement there would be a stiff-legged deadlift. So show them what that looks like. And again, you'd use a barbell in the gym. Feet closer together. And stiff-legged doesn't mean hyper-extended knees. You lock your knees. That's all that means. And then come up. Just give them some speed like you would in the gym. And then you can see how that effectively works the hamstrings. Andy's hamstrings, especially from the side, they just pop. So that's a you want to do barbell exercises for the hammies. That's pretty good. And you can even pigeon toe your feet for an added effect. 
So you actually put your big toes facing each other, and that often really activates the hams as well. And especially, I just saw the side of his thighs, uh, and his vastus really lateralis just started popping as soon as he did that. So that's another example yeah. of what we call tweakology. Just a subtle variation <coughs> of going from his feet facing forward to just pigeon toeing slightly, and you could see the fiber recruitment effect on him, which I'm sure he felt, which means from now on, when he does stiff legged deadlifts, I bet you're going to pigeon yeah, toe yeah, your I've feet. Never, I've never actually tried that before, but I could definitely feel, feel the difference. You could see it. You yeah. could see the vastus ladder and yeah. the thigh sweep on you just pop on that. So uh, that's a good one. Now, rear delts we've done in the past, but let's give them a, a cable rear delt, a single arm. <laughs> And who asked about this one? <clears throat> uh, I'd have to look here. One sec. Saprina. All right. So you want to do? Andy's just going to give you a basic uh, cable rear delt, single arm. Uh, so he gets away from the machine, so we get maximum stretch. And you can space your feet out far to get better base of support. And then it's going to work all up in here. I don't know how you, if you can see all that. Yeah, it's looking good. Uh... So you see that's rear delt, and then both sides want to switch sides, Andy? Get away from the machine so you can get it, let it stretch and pull you right in, and then you're going to get maximum rear delt activation doing that. Notice how he reaches out and up, gets that peak contraction. Good, good. And I'll show you how much we like this one, cameraman. There's the old guy when he was a young guy doing the same exercise. So in one of the articles that was done on me from uh, Muscle Mag International in 2003, that's yours truly doing the same exercise uh, with a different look, of course, because uh, I can only bring so much sexy back. Uh, Andy has the, Andy has the, uh, has the scoop on that one. So, um, but that was me doing the same exercise as I talked about, balanced shoulder development comes from balanced shoulder work, which is another argument, but it talks about why innervation training is so effective in hitting, especially a, a muscle like the shoulders, uh, from multiple angles. So hopefully that helped you out. That was one exercise. We've done it in a previous uh, live cast, but that's okay. We don't mind doing it again. Um, anything else there, cameraman? No. No? no? All right, folks. Hopefully you enjoyed this edition of the Coach and Andy Show. And we'll be coming right back at you next week with another episode. Uh, fill in your comments, your questions, anything you want us to cover in future episodes, we'll be happy to do so. Final thoughts? No, I think, uh, I think that's about it. Stay tuned. I think we'll leave it till next Thursday. We'll see you next time, folks. Take care.